Good evening. Welcome to Street Talk. Uh, tonight um, is very important. Um, we're on March uh, 25th, I guess it is. It's, it's, the, it's the day after all, all the, uh, the people were, were down in Washington, D.C. Um, and in the March for Their Lives uh, and around the country. And you know what? The day after is the day that we got to hit the ground running and we have to deal with the real issues that are coming up that are being brought on by all these wonderful kids that are, that are out there and, and really um, uh, speaking to us as, as adults, as, as lawmakers, um, and as, uh, as just hu human beings. Um, but we're talking about school safety and uh, we're talking about uh, uh, youth services today and how can we address um, the, the, the epidemic, really, uh, of violence in, in, in schools, but not just in our schools, um, but for young people um, to be able to live and, and survive, uh, especially in, in our cities, you know, um, when I think about the length of life that I, I'm, I'm going to have, and they, they give me a, a, at the day that I'm born, you know, somewhere in the 70 to 80 year, year range. And uh, you think about the length of life that somebody who was born in an inner city, and a lot of people just pray that they make it past 18 or, or, or 21 or 22. And um, we have to do more. And, and, and we have to talk about uh, uh, what are the major issues for this um, and, and how do we stop school violence and um, uh, what we can do as communities in order to make this better for all communities. Um, and, 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 I, and I think that's important. And I, I have somebody on with me uh, uh, today who's, who's a very good friend um, who I, I, I said to him straight, straight out, um, he, he, he runs uh, New Haven Youth Services, and uh, he asked me, well, what do you know about New Haven Youth Services? And I said, nothing. <laughs> and that's the problem, <laughs> is I know nothing. So Jason Bartlett, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to have you on, on the show. Obviously, uh, um, what you do uh, is, is incredibly important, um, and, and I know... Uh, because we, we have mutual friends that you, you, you put your heart and soul into uh, our, our, our youth of today. Mm -hmm. um, but um, what's it like for, 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 for kids um, in, 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 in our cities right now? Because, you know, New, Haven, New Haven's a, a, a definitely one of the three biggest cities. Um, what are the issues that they face on a day-in, day-out basis? Well, I do think that uh, there's a disproportionate number of kids that are traumatized in the cities. Um, they did a survey in New Haven and found that over 50% of the kids experience some sort of trauma. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that, that can come from, you know, a lot of different places. But, you know, if there's gun violence in the city and, and a kid's uh, friend gets shot, I mean, it, it's just like this ripple effect. Uh, there's uh, things going on in the home whether it be domestic violence or some other, you know, kind of thing, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily get taken care of right away. There's all kinds of, of trauma. So, um, you know, I do think, and, and I think that when you look at poverty and you look at some of the socioeconomic factors and indicators, um, kids do go through a lot. Uh, we have very resilient kids, um, but there is a lot to kind of overcome. And uh, we know that we have failing schools, for example, um, that our schools are not, there's an achievement gap in the state of Connecticut. And so our black and brown kids are not necessarily getting the same um, educational services that other folks are getting in the suburbs. And one of the things that I always say is like, when you can't read at grade level, you are automatically oppressed. So um, that happens, unfortunately, to way too many kids where they're behind in terms of just literacy. And so that means that your trajectory all through your, your K through 12 experience, once you fall behind is very different because you know, um, part of the disengagement um, that uh, a young person might experience is because you know, they're not 
feeling good in school. So they start to disengage themselves and then look for other avenues to, um, to re-engage. So, um, so it's, a, it's, a complicated, uh, it's a complicated picture, um, but there are things that we can do and I think there are things that we have done that are, make us pretty successful and actually make New Haven a model for other uh, cities to emulate and to copy and um, to take best practices from. So we're pretty proud. We have a mayor actually who's made youth and education a top mm -hmm. priority, Mayor Harp, uh, Tony Harp. And I think that's very unusual because I think most big city mayors make downtown development or you know some big development project. That's their number one thing. They think that that's going to bring jobs and that's just going to change everything. And I think one of the things that, that Harp realized was that it's kind of a difficult to attract big companies to your city if your neighborhoods are popping off and if there's uh, urban violence and, and, and that kind of a thing. So you really have to pay attention to your disengaged youth, to your kids, make sure that they have services, pay attention to your schools and make sure that they're moving you know, towards a positive path of, of successful outcomes. And uh, when you can set that environment, it's a lot easier to keep your city vibrant and attract companies which then you know all has positive ripple effects so we've kind of done things like that in that order kids and education first and then the economics and and the business uh, ass kind of second so I would kind of start there I, I think like you said it, it, it is a ripple effect mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of times um, uh, when when cities do focus in on on the downtown they think it's like Okay, I want I want the center. I want this, you know, uh, beautiful jewel, and then they hope that it's gonna ripple out. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, what I see is I see like the center, <laughs> and then I see you know the northern like slight suburbs, the southern slight suburbs, the east and the west, and they're really forgotten about. And this is the place where people are living which are the majority of, of, of your population mm -hmm. uh, within that so you're and right the media, we, put, and the media plays a part in that too so even if even if your downtown is rustling and bustling you know the media is going to say well in Hartford there was a shooting and da, da, da. now it might be you know three miles from downtown or you know not mm -hmm. part of downtown which you know might be vibrant or in New Haven the same thing could happen um, but once the media kind of focuses in on the negative, then people are like, oh, I don't want to go to New Haven, I don't want to go to Hartford or Bridgeport or whatever. Um, you know, we've been able to change that because, quite frankly, our statistics since 2011, you know, crime has totally gone down. Um, since Mayor Harp's come, uh, we've had phenomenal statistics. I mean, last year um, in Hartford and Bridgeport, there were around 30 homicides. We had seven. Um, and since we had youth stat and some of our youth programs since 2014, uh, we've only had one um, young person under, under 19 years old die uh, from a homicide. And when I first uh, came into this position uh, in 2014, we had five between December and April. So we had to do some things very quickly um, and engage our youth and engage the community uh, in order to kind of you know, triage that and stop that and, and move us in a different direction. And I think we've been real successful doing that. Well, I think it, it comes down to um, priorities. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I know uh, at the beginning of every session, um, I, I usually uh, I'll watch, um, I don't know, it's probably like close to well over a couple hundred different groups that, that, that are going up to Hartford um, and and uh, they um, usually have minimal grants or other things that they're that they're working on um, that are important in, in investments in our, in our communities and I, and I like to bring this up because I know a lot of the the, the lawmakers from the suburban side of, 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 of life a lot of them uh, uh, try to say well you know if you if, if you, you pull yourself up from your from your bootstraps <laughs> You, you know, I mean, that's that's a nice way of saying it. When 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 you when you it's pull kind of yourself from your bootstraps and you're already up here, it's not as hard to do as as when you start out 
uh, at a much lower level. And, and you're, you're talking about um, trauma. Mm -hmm. um, I guess what people don't real, realize about trauma is, um, yes, kids are resilient. And, and um, they will uh, uh, get past things at, to, a, to a certain level. But then they'll see a similar trauma and it brings them back down to the place that they were previously. I mean, that's, that's really what post-traumatic post stress disorder is, is really, really about. And I, I, I know I was bringing this up. I, w I was talking to Robin Porter uh, uh, the other day, um, uh, you know, great rep from, from New Haven, mm -hmm. Hamden. And, and, and I said, you know, poverty has its own post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. <laughs> to it because every time that you feel like you've engaged to a certain level or you've gotten to a certain point, you know, that one thing will hit and it, and it almost makes you feel like you, you go back down to that level. So there's there's a lot, and, and young people to don't even know that they're having the trauma, really. I mean, they, no. so it's not like you know they're looking to go um, see a therapist or, or or get get it addressed. Um, one of the things we do do in New Haven is something we call rapid access. Um, so you know I'm, we're really big on restorative practices, making sure that we stop the uh, school to prison pipeline, mm -hmm. and not letting kids just get suspended or expelled from school. So. We started a program, um, one of the things I recognized was like, even if something happened, kids are resistant, they're not going to go to a therapist. Um, you know, adults, we don't like to go to, you know, a lot of folks, you know, go see a therapist. That's a, that's a difficult thing to do. So what we did was, so if a kid acts out, maybe he, t you know, mouths off, he's cussing out a teacher or he does something physical. Uh, to somebody else or, or whatever the behavior is like what is the underlying reason mm -hmm. for that and so what we did was rapid access where uh, we make a referral to actually uh, someone that we contract with therapists c clinicians and they <coughs> actually come to the school and do an assessment and uh, or go somewhere in the community with that kid and do an assessment and do it up to uh, three sessions so we do an assessment plus at least two to three sessions. In the city, we pay for it, or the Board of Education pays for it. And the reason why we do that is because, one, we want to know what the underlying reason is so that we can then, you know, put in some interventions in place to actually address it. Um, and two, <clears throat> we know that you got to have a relationship with young people or, or anybody to actually get them to the therapist. So. Once we do the assessment, we figure out what the underlying uh, need is, we get them to the right place. And they're m less resistant to do it. But insurance doesn't pay, okay, for that mm -hmm. clinician to go to the school and actually do the assessment or have a, a, a session. Um, and so that's why the government, in this case in New Haven or the Board of Education, we do it together, is actually paying for that. And then once we develop the relationship, and sometimes we'll make it part of um, the resolution, okay? So instead of us suspending you or expelling you from school, we're going to do a whole list of, of things that you have to do, and mental health uh, services is, is part of that. Um, so that <clears throat> that's how we've been able to keep kids in school and kind of address some of this stuff. Um, because that's where it all populates. That's that's where you're going to see it exhibit. Um, is you know it's going to happen right there in the school. And so one of the things we're very proud of is uh, you know four four years ago ex expulsions were like 155 kids, mm -hmm. which get two hours of classroom. We remind people uh, once you're out of school, you only get two hours. Uh, I don't know what you learn a day in that. Um, but we had 155, uh, two years ago it was down to 55, and last year we're down to 14. So we have 14 for a big city like New Haven expulsions. Um, and we've dropped, uh, suspensions were in the 3000s, and they're down in 1500 or less. So our kids are spending more time in the classroom and more time in the schools. Um, and one of the big reasons, I think, is, is having this, this rapid access as well as training teachers and other professionals um, that we need to figure out what is actually happening. <clears throat> Did something happen in the home the night before? 
is mm -hmm. there some sort of trauma that hasn't been dealt with? You know, why is a kid acting out? They're not just choosing to come in and they're well, bad kids. I, I always look at it as, and I've been in mental health for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have your basics of, of, of behavior, which is ABC. Antecedent, which is what happened, you know, uh, directly uh, prior, prior to, whether it's, um, like you said, something that is uh, external that's going on in, 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 in the home, or um, uh, for people who have mental health issues, it could be internal in your in your own thought process. Right. Then you have the actual behavior, and then you have the consequence. And and this isn't like uh, what people think of as you know normal. You know, okay, consequences. You you get like a timeout, which is what a suspension is or an expulsion. Um, but what are you really doing within that? What 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 sort of behaviors are you reinforcing with the consequences that you're given? And if, um, if for say, like uh, for, for a kid that's having a tough time, like in school with reading or education, you know, uh, might have, uh, have difficult circumstances at home, not a supportive environment, acts out in the class, and then the end part of it is, is the consequence is he, he's remu removed from, from that set of circumstances. Um, and so for, in his eyes, if I act out in that way, then I know I'm not going to have to deal with right. uh, uh, my, my reading issues or, you know, the fact that I can't do these things. No, I could be and home. it reinforces it. <laughs> I could be home, you know, enjoying TV or being right. out on the street. Um, so there's, yeah, so you don't really get uh, this consequence that, that you're trying to get by, you know, right. rem doing the removal. Um, it just doesn't work and, and there's no, there's no youth development, you know, that's positive from it. So what you really, what we need to be doing is diversionary tactics. So, uh, one of the things that we have in New Haven is, a, a youth, uh, project youth court, which is, uh, if, if somebody does something wrong, they'll go in front of their peers and they'll actually have a trial and, mm -hmm. you know, all their peers will, you know, dig it to do their defense and so on and so forth. And then the youth themselves determine what is the, what is the verdict or what is the resolution. And, you know, there was a kid that just went through it. Uh, and I know he got like a lot of community service he had to do. He had to then come and also be part of a, a other kids' trial. So he had to do mm -hmm. like seven others. Um, he had to do an apology to the teacher, to the uh, principal. Um, so there was a, a restorative piece of recognizing what you did and, and, and repairing the harm. And um, so those are the kinds of things. So that to go through that versus getting expelled um, or getting suspended, they, they went through that diversionary piece. Um, we also have juvenile review boards um, that do uh, more case management types of things to, to get into the home and get into, you know, putting in interventions um, to also, you know, move the kid to, instead of getting arrested or getting expelled or what have you. So we have diversionary, you know, types of tools that we use um, you know, for that. And we really have to get out of that punitive state. Uh, we're even looking at the uh, code of conduct. Mm -hmm. The code of conduct was written about 10 years ago and it was like, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And if, you know, it's very prescriptive and it's written just like a, a criminal code, you know, so if you if you do this, there's no exception, you're out, you know, and the teacher says, you did that, now you're out. And the principal, now you're out. <laughs> and it's very punitive. It's not welcoming to the parents. No. Uh, and and it's, 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 it's all about this versus, okay, what's going on? And uh, how do we resolve this? Because well, I, when I, you get to that level, you, you're denying these kids an education. And you're really pushing them from one school to another. I really feel this is what happened in, in Florida. You know, the kid got expelled. Then he went to another school, you know, and I really question what services that kid ever got and did anyone ever address his issues. And it, 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 it can't be where we live in a society where whatever the problem is, well, it's now your problem. No, no, I don't want to deal with it. Now it's your problem. And we just keep pushing them out until they're on their own 
or they're affiliating with other kids that are, you know, not good influences, and they're on their own, and it's a destructive and it's a negative, you know, type of system that we set up, and that that happens all the time. And when we get into an urban setting, that is the natural consequence of uh, not dealing with our kids and letting them, you know, figure it out on their own. And I, I think the big part of all of this, and, and uh, I know this is certainly something that we're heading towards uh, in, in, in recognition of that in our justice system, is, look, kids' brains aren't fully developed <laughs> until they're 26 years old. Right. Those, 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 those areas or those connections uh, 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 to the, the judgment centers, um, you know, are, 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 don't reach maturity until you're 26 years old. Mm -hmm. Now, if you throw in trauma or addiction or other things on, on top of it, you know, that ends up in a further delay. So right. how do we, how do we, I mean, and what you're really doing is you're, you're, you're teaching the kids uh, negotiation skills. You're, 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 you're teaching them um, how to be able to uh, manage themselves by, by taking them through a, a restorative process. Mm -hmm. It's not just like I was saying before where uh, a community and, and, and uh, says, you know, out of sight, out of mind. It's, it's not out of sight, out of mind anymore. It's, it, it comes back in, in, in one form or another. you surprised at how many people are resistant to um, accepting that. It's, it's so much easier to just push it off on, on somebody else. I mean, uh, you know, we have this program called Youth Stat, and it's a constant battle you know, um, with the principal, certain principals, certain educators, uh, not to, to, to actually get that whole piece, um, you know, and the adults have to be willing um, to understand that the mind isn't fully developed and a kid has a chance to change, you know, so whether it's the first time, the second time, the third time, you know, there's been many times that I've gone to advocate or that uh, folks that we work with go to advocate for a kid and, and, and we're told, well, we, we, we tried to work with them and we've done everything that we can do for this kid and it's not, you know, it, not, it's not going to work. And so, you know, and I get the frustration. I get mm -hmm. the frustration of, you know, you've tried to do certain things. But this is where I really think the community and the schools have to work together because you are gonna get frustrated. You, you know, this kid is gonna frustrate you. And so you need fresh eyes and you need the folks that are maybe potentially working with this kid after he leaves the building to actually work together. That's the transformative part, I think, of what we're trying to do in New Haven. Everybody likes to talk about community schools, but very few, there's very few schools that are actually community schools. There's very few schools that actually welcome parents into the building. There's very few schools that actually welcome the community to come in. You know, nothing irritates, uh, nothing has irritated some people in New Haven more than a Jason Bartlett to come in who doesn't have a degree as an educator, okay, to come in and say, well, what's this kid's reading level? And then for them to scramble to figure out, oh, well, uh, I don't know oh, what this is. And then, and then the question, well, why are we doing this if the kid has, if the kid's, you know, a sophomore and he has a sixth grade reading level, what is the intervention that you put into place? I mean, that's a, you know, to show your dirt or show the bad stuff and, and have other people like, you know, it's got to be, you know, everyone has their own emperor, empire, right? And to have to let people come in and to question what's happening is a very difficult thing for people to do, and um, you know that's a big part of the problem too. I always look at it as uh, a big part of the programs that I work with with uh, brain injury. They're, they're all person centered, so uh, when we design programs, um, you know there there might be 500 people that are on this on this program. It's not a program of 500 people. It's 500 programs <laughs> for mm -hmm. 500 individuals because everybody's in individual needs are, are, right. are, are going to be different. And that's exactly right. So when you're dealing with disengaged youth, you've got to have an individual success plan for mm -hmm. each person, each young person. 
And what you have to, what we do is we look at each kid and we try to focus on what is their passion, what is their strength. So I know all the things that they did wrong. Everything, you know, we know we know what a little bad, whatever, mm -hmm. but what is their strength and then build off of that. Um, so in terms of youth stat, that's exactly what we do. Um, so we've identified um, that we have over 700 kids that we consider disengaged, that we went out and got their parental consent to actually have the community work with the school and come up with an individual success plan for each kid. Um, and that's under the, 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 the youth stat. And we have all their information we put up in a, in a software program. It's like a Facebook and we put all their stuff up there and we case manage it and we talk with the schools you know and the community actually talk about this kid and manage the plan for each one of those kids and the idea is to re-engage them um, and what we do is we focus on their their strength and their and their passions and work off of that so it might be art might be music might be woodworking you know every once in a while a kid wants to be uh, in the military something like that so whatever it is, that's what we try to feed them. That's the food that mm -hmm. we give them, the spiritual food or the actual uh, experience. And then we, we try to re-engage them that way. So I think that when you're dealing with young people, that's what you really need to do is, is figure out, ask yourself, take a moment and say, what is this kid's passion? And make sure that you have something that actually speaks to that. And that's how you can w develop a relationship to work with that kid to actually get him to do something that he don't really want to do. <laughs> it's, it's funny you say youth stat, and, and I can't help but uh, think of uh, New York City and, and Comstat. Uh, that's, what it was, <laughs> that's what it was modeled on. And, and, and I, I, I know uh, uh, as, 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 as much as he's not my favorite person on the face of the earth right at the moment, uh, but uh, Mayor Giuliani, mm -hmm. Uh, he did have a holistic approach to, to, to be able to, to, to work on a lot of these things and realize that, um, that there was an, an, an underlying problem. Well, I don't know if he had a holistic approach, but what he did... With crime, with crime yeah. and what they did with Comstat <laughs> was a little bit better well, here's what, about looking at well, it. Well, here's what Comstat does, is, and here's what a lot of cities make the mistake. Who is the, who are you trying to talk to? Right. Okay. So when you do in Comstat, you're like, here's, here's the hot spot. Here's I look at it, the right human right. version. <laughs> Not well, this the, is the what we're doing. So, yeah. so youth stat is who are we trying, who are we talking about? Mm -hmm. So when I go, let's go back to 2014, we had five murders in New Haven. Okay. So the mayor, uh, one of the things she did was she invited all the principals into her office, no board of ed people, just the principals, mm -hmm. and had a real raw conversation. What came from that was that they were going to go out and knock on doors of the disengaged kids and talk to them about resources and so on and so forth. This is before we developed any of our programs. And in order to do that, we call that My Brother's Keeper mm -hmm. campus, okay? That was after Obama in 2014. That's when he came out with My Brother's Keeper. So we did the My Brother. We were the first in the nation, actually, to do My Brother's Keeper. And we were going to go knock on those kids' doors. So the question became, well, who was that? And we had to figure out who are we talking about? Because, you know, you sit here and people talk about at-risk youth or, you know, mm -hmm. kids that are affiliated and getting, but it's like this broad thing. And um, we wanted to know exactly who, who were the targets. And in order to do that, we had to develop metrics. So we developed chronic absenteeism, mm -hmm. okay, kids that don't go to school, behaviors, so kids that are suspended, expelled, touch the juvenile justice system, and, and failing in academics, specifically uh, in literacy. So when we ran those three metrics, we were able to drill down. This is the first time we got the Board of Education to actually drill down and actually identify the, who the kids were. And then we shared that with the principals, and they would you know, say, yep, yeah, these are the kids, or whatever, maybe add a little something to it. And that was our pool of our disengaged youth. And that's what we developed a program. So we talk about youth stat. The, the, the reason why we have the stat part in there is because you have to know who you're trying to target and, and who's really having those issues. If you're just sitting there, oh, we're going to do something for disengaged youth and da-da-da-da-da, and I want money to go do this, and I want money to go do that, 
And then you go and you take the, the creme de la creme or the kids that don't really need the services, then what did you really solve? And so that's, why, that's how we came up with the youth stat part because we're very targeted and very specific about, okay, this is a young person that needs services. This is a, a young person that, that got lost. Or, you know, if we go back in his school records, you'll see something happened in fifth grade. He was an A student, and now all of a sudden he's not going to school, and now he's re-showing up, and he's not doing well. And so that's the, the, the stat part. Well, I always look at uh, if, if you walked into the prisons, how many people have uh, learning disabilities mm -hmm. in prisons? Um, and I, I know from my own point of view, is uh, I'm spelling dyslexic. I lucked. When I hit, you know, high school, right before I was about to go into college, came out the first, you know, personal computers that uh, had, had, had multi-mate. It didn't even tell you, go back and spell it for you. It just flashed the first letter that told you, you spelled this wrong. <laughs> and, um, but all through my high school or, 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 or middle school, you know, I had behavioral issues. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it, it, it was over the fact that, you know, you get handed papers over and over again and they bleed red. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you get frustrated. Right. And that's, that's kind of where the disengagement begins. It's, it, it's, it's not in, in high school that it begins. It begins somewhere in, 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 in elementary and slowly builds through middle school. So by the time you get to high school. Right. That's where, you know, it, it, it really comes more to light because you have a larger opportunity to, to go screw up, as right. I'll, and, I'll say it. And so that's where we're at right now. So in high school, you're actually doing triage. Right. In, in middle school and before, you're actually doing prevention. Um, and so what we've tried to do is, you know, we started out triage, and now we're trying to move to uh, prevention. So right now i got a private grant. Uh, from the Dalio Foundation where we're specifically looking at rising eighth graders and freshmen um, because if you have a successful freshman year then you're going to graduate and then you're going to have successes. If you have, if you fail your first two semesters as a freshman mm -hmm. then you know school's not going to be good. The high, your high school experience is not going to be a good one and you probably are going to drop out of school and, th and that's just shown across the country. So what we, what we have to do is, this is like, kind of like the last chance to do prevention, mm -hmm. is to get tutors and mentors and um, services to those kids. And that's where we do a youth stat as well. So we, we're trying to get over, your overage, undercredited kids, kids that have stayed back, and kids that are having uh, issues in terms of being successful. That's where you really want to do that intervention because if we can get them back up and have a successful freshman year, they're going to have a successful experience. Um, and, and the same is true in the, in the eighth grade. So if we can, you know, graduate them from eighth to ninth grade and get that successful experience, then uh, we're going to have better outcomes, definitely. Better, better outcomes, I mean, obviously uh, for, for people in the city, and that's, that's where the economics tie in. Better outcomes, you know, better people to be able to go into the workforce well, here, means, here's means, the deal. means that you have... have so what, uh, one of the things we did was we brought vocational back to New Haven, okay? Vo, you mm -hmm. know, vocational left all the high schools. When I was going to school, you could do woodworking and sure. all that kind of stuff. That, that ended up disappearing from our, our regular neighborhood high schools. So one of the movements was to bring that back um, to develop after-school programs, which spoke to it. Um, but, you know, in doing that, we had to test even. So we have a, a whole group of kids go to Eli Whitney after school, mm -hmm. four days a week. They get a certificate in manufacturing, plumbing, carpentry, um, culinary, things like that. And because uh, a lot of times you wake up as a sophomore and now you want to do that but you didn't, you know, go in mm -hmm. in the eighth Start. or ninth grade. Yep. Plus now they make it really hard to get into our, our Votech high schools, by the way. So anyway, my, um, my point with that is, what was my point with that? Um, what were you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I just lost my train of thought. Developing, developing this, the, the, the skill sets 
uh, oh, and, my point and, with and that, a workforce. So my point with that, you, you made me think of something, which was in order to do any of that, you have to read at the ninth grade. And so we had 60 kids my first year when we were trying to get this uh, Eli Whitney program done, 60 kids that we had to test. And uh, out of the 60, we only had a handful. These were our dis highly disengaged kids. Only a, a handful uh, were actually past the ninth grade. Most of the kids were sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And I showed that to the mayor um, who basically, you know, had a fit. And that's when the mayor, you know, said, okay, we have to get our schools and everybody involved in education the number one priority is to get the kids to read at grade level um, so you can't do that vocational work unless you can read at the ninth grade you know you can't do even you know be a janitor today uh, you know it's it's not that easy you have to read complicated formulas it's and there's a lot that a lot more that actually goes into a lot of these uh, jobs in in the you know in the blue collar areas than um, than it was you know 10 20 years ago so we still need to make sure we need to ensure that our kids are still at a certain level so that they can a actually have an opportunity to even do those jobs because they're just much more complicated they, they are and, and advanced manufacturing uh, I think uh, th things that aren't going to come back you, you're not going to see the same sort of uh, assembly line work you know that you did through the 50s 60s 70s or even 80s and into 90s it's 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 you have to know how to be able to do some specific uh, uh, tasks mm -hmm. uh, and in and, and order to be able to run the machines and what uh, some people don't realize you know what if you if you're a CNC uh, a machine operator or, or, or you're you're a tool and die maker those are like jobs that pay a lot of money if you're a tool and die maker and you're 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 going into to a manufacturer you you've got a a six-figure paycheck mm -hmm. uh for for because it, it, there are there are some artisan almost parts to it but you have to know you know the specifics of 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 what you're doing or even if you're 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 doing carpentry you have to know Right. Geometry in order to figure out uh, uh, some of these things. Uh, I mean, with building trades and other things along those lines, there are jobs out there, and there are, there are jobs in Connecticut that that go unfilled, uh, and a lot of them are in these positions. But you have to have the educational background or the basics to be able to get into that. And, and we have to do a better job exposing our kids to those opportunities because mm -hmm. they, they, they don't even realize, you know, they're about the money, but they don't know what it takes to get, you know, to that point. Um, we did. We do have the laborers union in uh, in Hill House High School, one of the, one of my little projects that I'm real proud of. And they actually are teaching uh, a class throughout the year. Last year was a pilot. We had about 20 kids go through it, and they actually took five of those kids upon graduating high school we got them on uh, driver's licenses paid for them to go to driving school and they're all in the they're all apprentices in the laborers uh, laborers union now and you know they're making like 55 um, and they're gonna increase that and what we want to do is bring in the plumbers next and kind of do the same thing so we do a, a funnel right from right from the high schools right into the union jobs um, but it's a big deal and it's a big thing and uh, you know again you have to be proactive to kind of you know make these opportunities available for well, our kids uh, but like like you said uh, and the, and this goes to, to, to some of the important things summer programs mm -hmm. um, I know for myself uh, I mean I've been I've been working since I was I was 10 years old my first job was obviously you know paper route I, I worked in restaurants I worked in gas stations um, I did exterminating. <laughs> uh, these, these are, these are uh, uh, you know, the basic jobs where, where you learn life skills. Mm -hmm. Life skills are, you know what, you have to get prepared at a certain time of the day in order to be at the job and show up at the job every day. Um, but if you're not giving people the opportunity to have those, mm -hmm. Where, where are they going to learn them? Sure, and we have over a thousand applications every year for summer youth employment. 
Um, the legislature cut that last year. Actually, the governor cut it. The legislature did not put that in the budget. Um, so I was really, really upset. Went to the mayor uh, and our board of alders and said, you know, we employ over 600 kids. Um, in what do you want to do? So it's about four hundred fifty thousand dollars, and actually we ran the program in a deficit. The, they told us to go ahead and do it, mm -hmm. um, and it was you know for those reasons like the youth development that happens uh, for our kids uh, in terms of being able to get those jobs, get those experiences. Uh, a lot of times, what comes out of that is a mentor. So they'll work with our kids over the summer, and then. You know, they develop a relationship and say, you know, do you want to stay? And it turns into an actual, you know, kind of permanent job or, you know, throughout the school year uh, or other opportunities come from it. They help them, you know, get into college, all kinds of stuff, all kinds of good stuff happens in terms of those relationships. I had a dad come in the other day and say, thank you. I said, oh, what are you, what are you thanking me for? He says, you gave my kid a job. <laughs> he goes, you don't realize it, but you gave my kid a job. And I said, well, you know, that's what we do. And he says, he says, no, 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 you don't understand. When he got that paycheck, he changed. The maturity level, what I saw over the course of the summer of him having his own money and being able to go and, you know, you know buy what he wanted to buy and save some money, uh, things like that, that really affected his self-esteem. And... Um, you know, before the show started, we were talking about self-esteem and how important that is. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so having these jobs, these beginning jobs, um, and having, you know, the legislature, you know, actually employing a, a summer employment for our urban youth, um, you know, people don't realize the benefits of that. Not to mention um, all the summer camps in the city of New Haven take advantage of our young people Mm -hmm. And most of the camps are, are run pretty much with uh, the youth, the high school youth for the, for the, for the little guys. And uh, if we were to take away summer employment um, as a program, uh, we wouldn't have you know, any camps in the city. And so we'd have a lot of kids uh, not doing pro-social activities. It's 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 a it's a monetary ripple effect because mm -hmm. it's not just the money that you're 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 spending on on the youth. It's 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 also helping the community in this in the same impact, and it also gives the next level down below them uh, an opportunity to say, oh, you know, if I if I get into eleventh grade, you know, I have this opportunity too. These are, you know, people that are close to my age. They're not, you know, adults per se that are like you know older adults so mm -hmm. to speak who, who, who are there um but you do you have to you have to show people that there 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 there's hope out there because otherwise you just see the same you know like poverty over and over again that just reinforces itself mm -hmm. and, and and it's uh this is how we pull each other up, not an individual pulling up their boots, bootstraps. It's it, it's about what a community does, and I, and I, uh, I, I I venture back to that because I think that that's a lot of um, where uh, our, our cities kind of uh, fell apart at a certain point. Um, is there was a sense of community uh, back decades and decades ago, where people did look out for each other and they, they 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 did see see it through and you you knew everybody in your neighborhood and what was going on with them within their family and um, I think with uh, uh, you know everybody kind of fleeing to like the suburbs uh, you, you you miss that core capacity to be able to do that and and it's something that you you, you have to uh, you have to almost like build it and, you know, if you build it, they will come, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so to well, speak. Well, you definitely, you know, it goes back to what we s said in the very beginning, which is, you know, you can just just pay attention to your downtown or you can pay attention to your neighborhoods. And you have to have neighborhood cohesion. You got to have mm -hmm. what we call them management teams. You know, you got to have people, you know, being active in their neighborhood and actually, you know, looking out for each other and kind of trying to grow the neighborhood together. Um, I think that that's real key in terms of 
of um, how we move our cities forward. Because if there is no neighborhood cohesion, um, that's where you get your breakdown. That's where, mm -hmm. you know, nobody wants to call the police. You know, we don't want to <coughs> snitch or, you know, uh, nobody's holding anyone else accountable. Um, and, you know, blight happens and, you know, other people come in and take advantage. Um, and, and it just kind of spirals out of control. So, um, you know, that's, that's major, uh, is, is neighborhood cohesion and, and just kind of keeping down the blight and getting the neighbor. I mean, we do uh, walks all the time mm -hmm. um, to make sure that people know what the resources are and, and take advantage of them and, and, and really develop the neighborhood cohesion part. And, and most of those neighborhoods really want to do something for the kids. Um, you know, that's, that's been kind of uh, very welcoming for me is how many people actually in our city, in, at least in my city, in New Haven, they actually want to be doing positive things for the kids and keeping them active and that kind of thing. And I think that that energy um, is, is, is how we bring our city together and keep it a vibrant city. So now we talk about dollar, dollars and cents mm -hmm. for, 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 for the programs that New Haven operates um, about how much do they spend on, on youth services? I'm very good at getting money <laughs> from other sources, not necessarily from the city. No, I don't know. It's a, it probably works out to our budget is probably like only a million dollars, and then I probably get another, you know, um, you know, close to a million from uh, foundations and and other in the state and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, in New Haven. A uh, great percentage of the budget goes to police and fire. Yeah, um, that's that's where you know public safety is is really gobbling up a great deal. Public safety, education, and debt. <laughs> Youth well, is I, not I, quite you know. I, I say my little I, you know what, I, 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 I say that because. Um, you know, they, they say the, the ounce of prevention is, you know, is, is, is a lot less right. experienced than the, the pound of cure. The pound of cure is when people go into the jail systems and it costs $50,000 a year to have them be in that setting. Mm -hmm. The more that we can divert from that, and, and uh, you talk about murders, I mean, uh, murders went down, you said, by... Uh, 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 how many were we talking about? Well, I was comparing the other three cities. So they had yeah. like 30 in the other two, and we only had six, seven. So it was it was pretty extraordinary, our number. And since 2011, um, you know, we, I don't know the percentages off the top of my head, but, but it's those, been precipitously but those are, going those, down. But those are less people that are in, you know, our, our, our jail systems, which... You know, I, I, I thank God, you know, Connecticut is uh, jail population has has been, you know, on on a, a, a decreasing slope. Right. Um, and uh, I think it's important to be able to focus and realize that, OK, well, this is how much money it costs to have people in jail. You don't just get to say, oh, they're suspended or, oh, they're thrown away or, oh, they're this, oh, they're that. Think of all the expenses that are associated and how much you get and how much really uh, human building that you're, you're, that you're doing with a couple million dollars versus, you know, what, what the end outcome is, is that you're saving not just in people's lives and devastation and everything else, but it's dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that that's what people don't necessarily understand. They say, you know, three strikes and you're out. Or, you know, you get locked away forever. Well, you know, you get locked away forever and you're, 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 you're still having to pay for that. And then you're having to pay again, you know, when the person has to come back and, and, and re-enter into society. And they have that much trouble and then you have... And you yeah, can't get a the, job. the big R, R word, re recidiv recidivism. Right. Um, and you're right. They, they, they can't get a job. Whereas if we deal with, you know, the youth, mm -hmm. 
at, at that point and help them, you know, build the tools that, 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 that they're going to need, um, they're going to have, like, the opportunities to go beyond. Um, I was up in Hartford, I don't know, this must have been a good couple of years ago, and I was watching this uh, 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 forum that they had, and they were talking about um, uh, intervention mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, uh, at, at, at a certain level. Um, and uh, they were talking about uh, youths that had uh, uh, police intervention and, and uh, were in, in jail uh, versus uh, some kids that had uh, absolutely no, like, you know, touch, touches with, 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 with the police departments and other things along those lines. And they said, they were talking about how during that age frame, you, everybody's likely to, to, to do something or to screw up, so to speak. Right. <laughs> but it, it, was, it was the ones that had, you know, the, the, the touches with law enforcement and, ev and everything else um, that uh, continued on and, 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 and had issues, uh, you know, well beyond like their teen, teen years. Mm -hmm. um, well, I asked when I, I think my first year or second year, I asked what, how many kids that actually have touched the juvenile justice system actually graduate? And yeah. basically it was like none. I mean, it was, it, was, it was ridiculous. So every time that they actually go, are incarcerated, they're not going to graduate from our high schools. No. They, may, no. they may get a GED. They may be able to get through adult ed. But I can tell you right now, every one of these kids that are incarcerated across the state of Connecticut, they're not graduating from, from now, we're trying to do better with that, um, and I think that, you know, even um, the prisons, the corrections mm -hmm. are trying to, yeah. to actually address some of that because um, the quality of the education that they were getting there was ridiculously bad. Mm -hmm. uh, but th so the reforms have been being made over the last few years to, to kind of address that. But, you know, to your point, if you screw up and, you know, you're 15 and, you know, um, you get locked up even for a short period of time, you know, that just spirals out and you're not going to graduate and, and that becomes a problem because it just, it just never, it never leaves you, which is why the restorative justice piece, why the police departments in all communities um, can't go in there like, you know, you know, hard cops and I'm going to do this, that, and the other thing and let's arrest you and so on and so forth. I mean, you really have to do everything you can possibly do to not arrest um, minors because you have to know that if, if, if you're doing that and, and if they go through the courts and they, and they do any time, it's over for them. Um, so if there is anything that we can do um, before that happens mm -hmm. to do an intervention, to avoid that, then that kid has a shot. But I can tell you, you know, um, kids that, that are incarcerated that come back, I mean, trying to, we, we, we're doing all kinds of stuff right now to re-enter them uh, back into the schools um, and to give them that individual success plan. But I mean, I don't have the numbers on what that's gonna look like, but that's, uh, I, and I think we do better than most other places. But just people need to know that because that's why restorative practice is so important. Because if they if they touch the juvenile justice system, uh, chances are you know everything just drops precipitously in terms of their success. So, absolutely. And you know what? Uh, Fifty five minutes goes. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't too bad. Uh, uh, but I, I, you know what? I enjoy this because. It's it, it's it's more than just asking questions. It's also getting answers, and and and, I, and I'm glad that you guys in, in, in New Haven, that you you uh, you have a mayor that chooses to 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 in, invest so much in in, in the human capital uh, of her city, and, and and realizing that it's it's upon that human capital that you're 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 going to make uh, uh, you, you know New Haven. Uh, continue to be a place where people want want to come to, want, where they want to work, and it's not the just the jewel of downtown; it's the jewel of the the, the entire city. Is 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 what we do, um, obviously, to educate and 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 help raise up, you know, our children. 
mm -hmm. uh, in a place where maybe they don't have to face that 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 uh, uh, trauma, uh, and 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 they can be the the generations that break that cycle. Um, and and I think that's an important for what we do. And you know, I think the 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 the, the kids um, and everybody that went out and and marched. Um, I think they're really focusing in on this, but there's multiple pieces to this. There's and a lot of pieces. What was really great about the march, though, was that it wasn't just about Florida. They had the foresight Florida. to bring it about Chicago, to bring about L.A., to bring about, um, you know, Hogue was talking about, you know, what about our black yes. students and making sure yep. that their voices were heard. So. The students themselves, I, I really think, got it or get it. They do. And, and that, that's particularly impressive. And, and I see it in New Haven sometimes, too. We have our Board of Education. It's usually the students that are on the board that make the most sense. Uh, so, you know, do us all well to listen to our young people every once in a while because usually they're, they're on top of it. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're in New Haven and you're helping them to find their voice. So thank i got to thank you. Appreciate it. And with that, we can run the street. <laughs>